So I've been doing this for a long, long time. And uh, when I started, uh, that's the kind of equipment I've used, which I don't think anybody here has ever, has anybody seen it before? It's a called a key punch. And this is Bev Wellman, it's my wife, as many of you have met, who's a researcher here now. And we met, and then she, we had, you get, when you put stuff into a computer, you get instant results back. In those days at Harvard, it was 12 hours coming back. And you had to get it right, which, so we used stacks of what we called IBM cards, and we would physically bring them to the computer center, through the snow, of course, uh, which it usually is. And one day, I dropped them. And she was visiting me. She was just my girlfriend then. And she said, oh, I'll help you put them all back together. And it has to be in the right order. So we spent hours putting up hundreds and hundreds of cards back in the right order. And at the end of that, I said, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> it took a little bit more than that, but anyway, that's the idea. So um, this talk, I'm, as in the book that, that I've recently written with Lee Rainey, who is the co-director of the um, lead director of the Pew Internet and American Life Study, which is doing the most and often the best research on American use of the internet, uh, is an attempt to put everything together. It's not a sorry. It's not a uh, specific talk on one little project, but it, but an attempt to to integrate. Uh, the topics of the book, which is somewhat what we're doing in the New Media 5771 class as well. And there's Lee, and there's the, the book uh, information. And somebody, anybody in class have a copy with it? Yeah, we can wave it around. So if you buy it, I get an extra cup of coffee from Starbucks. <laughs> but I don't get much so this is basically uh, the talk. Um, the new ways to look at things. Um, we're trying uh, to deal with uh, different ways. Actually, I don't make those things. And what, what I'm contending, but only for North America. By the way, North America is a term only Canadians use. Uh, it means America plus Canada. Americans don't use it because they think we're just part of them. Uh, and Mexicans don't like it because they think they're part of North America. But in Canada, we basically means similarities that, that between the two countries, of which there are many, and some differences that we're not going to dwell on now. So if you hear the term North America, that's what I mean. And what we argued in this book, and I think demonstrated, I wouldn't say proved, is that three things have been happening. First is I think I'm going to be better off sitting here so I can see my slides better. Uh, the first is that there's been a turn away from groups to social networks, and I'll talk about that in a second. The second is something we know a lot about, that's the internet. But I want to make two situations with the internet. One is that it's far flung, we all know that. I mean, people in my class use Skype or Weibo to talk to their friends and relatives a lot and get information about the world, but also that it's personalized. That in the uh, fact that it's really the first communication medium that came to you alone. I just realized my phone's on, which is the second one. Um, that in the old days when, when letters came, or telephones came, or people knocked on your door, uh, the whole household would know about it and would be connected with you. But now it's it's you receiving it, and that's a very personal, very powerful, and may have centrifugal things of pulling families and work groups apart. We'll talk about that later. So it's not always a good thing. Uh, third is the mobile stuff. And we think that this is actually different than the internet, because it's always in your pocket or your purse. And information is always available to you. And you're always accessible to others, whether you like it or not. And we've seen also a very, two really many paradigm shifts in uh, mobile stuff. 
The first is the shift from voice to text that really is pretty well complete. When I asked my graduate course, almost no one has talked on the telephone, on their mobile phone today, but they've all texted. And I'm not sure what the implications are for that. Uh, is it less information but more frequent information going through? Uh, Rich Ling, let me tell everybody in this room, Rich Ling is the greatest scholar on mobile communications. And he's coming here in the next, uh, next Wednesday to talk in my class at um, 4 o'clock. And you're all invited uh, to come there. And, and he's been really talking about how the big shift of this has happened. But secondly, is the second shift that's happening has been from phones to smartphones, and in which powerful information is at your fingertips. So that my students, when they're even though they're polite, can sometimes check me out by just calling, pulling out their their phone and saying, "Okay, Wellman said that, but does he know what he's talking about?" By the way, everybody but Colleen in my class uses a, a Mac. Colleen, you're the only um, Windows person like me. Okay, but the thing that my class is. In, I, I did not prepare all my lectures before I came because I wanted to be responsive to the students. And the thing that most people are interested in is not the internet and the mobile stuff. I think people here think they know that. I wonder sometimes. But is the uh, turn from groups to social networks. People had some trouble grasping that con concept. OK, here's a group. These are a stylized little thing. Think of them as can fail or, or whatever, the inter, what's it, the interlace, that, that crazy thing there? In other words, bounded networks in which people all know each other, traditional villages, be they Chinese or American or traditional neighborhoods would be a group. And most scholars and most people think that the world is composed of groups. What we contend and to some extent show in North America, remember that term, is that people really live in multiple social networks so that no one group controls their lives. And uh, that's a very powerful thing. It means uh, that you're fragmented, that any group, any network you're in has only partial attention. You may not be able to get as unquestioning social support from each network, you may also escape the social control of networks. Not in Singapore, but in North America, people often move from group-based small towns and villages to cities to get away from social control. In Singapore, it's a lot harder. In fact, I wonder where people go when they date here, if they live at home with their parents. I won't ask for opinions, but it, it certainly uh, it's more observed society. So, uh, and I did this talk with Lee Rennie originally about libraries. That's why you see the little library stuff. So it, we're probably all members at one point of multiple groups, but now even more social networks. And then, and if you look at the chart below, uh, I'll probably go on to that. Uh, well, here I, I'm giving you that. Um, and this is the classic picture of a group. This is a small Tuscan village. I'm sorry, I was a little lazy. I could probably, somebody find a Chinese village for me. Um, we could put that up and it would look very, very similar. Very often they have walls around them, so you know who's inside and who's not outside. And they have traditional families. This is from what I and they have Walnut and maybe uh, Evelyn, did you get to read this when you were a child? No, you were, you were too young. Um, is the traditional way American children got, and, and Canadian got to read. Uh, tr role definition is father and his mother. Father goes off to work. Mother stays home to take care of the children. And very strong boundaries between work and family, but very strong local family relationship. Every child, over the, every person in America over the age of 60 has read this book and similar ones like that. Uh, but now we're moving to, uh, let me go back, to the notion of social networks, which is this, that we're, we're connected in multiple ways, but we're not very tightly connected. 
we move around and we have some autonomy in the network. And let's talk about some implications. One, when you go to networks, uh, you get the situation, you get the impression that things, that, that it's, the notion of community is less visible. Now that's something I need to explore more with my students and with you in Singapore, because I was shocked when people told me that they don't talk to people when they live in, in high-rise uh, condos or, or things like that, that, that there's less local communities. Is that true, Tracy, you think? Yeah. So, whereas in North America, people know everybody's face who lives in, in, on the same street, or if they're in high-rise, certainly on the same floor. So then the question then becomes, how do you find community in Singapore? Or do you find community in Singapore? And I don't, I don't know the answer. I, I've only been here three weeks. So you know, I only have half the answers now. That's a joke. Um, but I at least think I can raise some questions. And I'm going to say that, that this is anomalous, what's here. That the notion that you have low, intense local relationships is something um, that certainly all through Europe and North America, um, people take for granted. OK, but certainly neighborhood groups, which used to be the cornerstone of North American life, uh, aren't as visible. Most people know only four or five neighbors. So there's been fears that things are really falling apart. And I've given you a lot of uh, social scientists, the most recent one being Sherry Turkle, who wrote a book which I think is totally wrong called The Lone Together. Has anybody read that? You, you, what's wrong? Um, she's gotten she, she's gotten a lot of press for it, but she based all her findings and following her daughter around, and her daughter's at MIT, or I'm sorry, she lives in Cambridge, Mass, the home of MIT and Harvard. So it's not a random sample of anybody, um, or not even a representative sample. But the claim is that uh, when because of technology, because people stay home and play with their computers all the time, that they don't talk to each other very much, that they don't find social support. I'm just going to go past a few things. Um, but what our claim is, is that we each have network-based communities, if you think of yourself as ego, the person in the center, that consists of kin, people you work with, friends, and neighbors. This once again is well, this is Toronto data from some years ago. And certainly kinship networks are the most connected, but um, they don't dominate lives. I, probably they do more here, and that's another question I would have. Uh, working ties are important. Uh, neighboring ties are becoming less important. And these are very separate sectors of people's lives. Now we found in North America, I haven't done the work, that the average person knows about 600 other people. Um, Jude is making a face. You think that's much too high, right? Yeah, I think uh, eight social networks tend to be about six to eight. Yeah, but if we say even a relatively weak tie, like you and me, um, you would count as part of that 600. These are not the people you're very close with. That's five or six. And the people that you're pretty close with, maybe about 20 or 30 including kinship ties. You know, and I, at lunch, we were talking about what people do in Chinese New Year here. And the first day you visit your very strong ties, and the second day you visit your somewhat strong ties. That's what someone told me. So that's actually pretty good data if you want to do a survey on, on, on extent of networks and who you visit and why you visit them and the order in which you visit them. You know, I've just, those are my class, that's a research design if you, if you want to do it. So people have little aware of context. When the phone rings, they don't say, where are you, very much. They just start talking to you. And they may not know who's around there. It, you are connected, but you are connected as individuals, not as, as whole groups. Uh, it's personal. Maybe the private concerns take care of public stuff. Uh, so that. You may not be as aware of your neighbors around you. You may just push past them getting on the bus because you're more connected. I mean, frankly, I've seen a lot of people get on buses here uh, holding their, their, their phones uh, and not noticing that they're stepping on you when they get on the bus or you. Um, 
it's not that they're impolite, but that they, their private lives, which is, they're certainly socially connected, but they're connected through their phones. Um, so, given that, there's less face-to-face -face observation of each other, less surveillance perhaps, but certainly more our surveillance of our peers electronically, uh, we could call that covalence, I, to turn my name up, but that's what you do. How many people have checked me out on Wikipedia or something like that? <laughs> you know, that's covalence. Um, in North America, there's a term called creeping, which is what people do when they go to each other's Facebook page and start seeing what's going on there. I'm not going to embarrass you. I believe everybody here has has checked on some on their friend's Facebook page and seen what's going on. Actually, I don't do Facebook because I don't want that kind of uh, covalence. And then uh, Steve Mann, who's my colleague in Toronto, and who invented Google Glass way before Google did, and walks around recording from the internet. He has a, a hard hat with an antenna sticking up and, and glasses on. Uh, he invented the concept of surveillance. Surveillance is when you're observing the powerful people. And he does that at, at, at riots, for example. He can do that uh, when he walks into a big department store like Robinson. He'll start, he'll actually visibly video them just to make the point. And then they get very mad. He says, well, look, your camera's up there. No camera in this room, is there? Good. Um, but there's a camera in the hallway, I believe, here, right? So we all have to be well behaved in the hallway. So that's the notion of, and that's a kind of trivial kind of thing, but we might have, you know, if they, do they publish income records in Singapore? How many, who earns what money in the university or stuff? No? Well, they do in Toronto if you make over $100,000 a year. So all public servants' incomes are published. So that, that becomes a little bit interesting for people achieve. So that's what we have. Uh, linked as individuals, but very well linked. Maybe even larger networks than we used to have. We also find that people's electronic interactions, Facebook, email, are integrated with their in-person interactions. That the people they like and speak to in person, such as say Pauline and me, but then Pauline will send me an email. So it's not like we're having a separate online and offline world. This may not be true for gamers. Gamers are very strange people. And uh, they just do online only. Do they ever see each other, those of you who study games here? No? Nobody studies games? OK. So um, but generally, there's the, and we've also found that people who are in online-only relationships, and they connect to each other. Like we did a study of Iranian women uh, giving each other social support in, in North America. And they were very lonely and isolated at university towns. And, um, and they had to keep explaining to Americans, always want to hug them, but no, I can't even touch you unless you're a family member. So my student and I did a study of that. And we found that very often these women, when they got to travel, would go, immediately go to travel to see each other. They had known each other through emails and listservs and Facebook, but then they immediately, when they had the opportunity, they fleshed it out, I'm using that word explicitly, um, by physical contact. What, what is that more achieved, less ascribed? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so used to being a sociologist. Okay, in sociology, uh, there's the contrast between achieved relationships and ascribed relationships. Ascribed is uh, things you're born into. The most obvious ones are ethnicity in Singapore. Or another obvious one might be caste and subcaste in India. I apologize to my Indian students here because you know this stuff better than I do. I'm just, I, no, I'm getting it wrong. So relationships that are determined by your status. Or if you like Iranian women who can only talk to people in their families, uh, who are into men in their families. I remember that my Iranian student invited some other women students to her flat uh, to have tea. And immediately when they came back, I said, OK, what does she really look like? Because you know she had always been 
hidden in, in, in Iranian garments and stuff. So. Uh, achieved the stuff you've got, like all sociologists talk to each other, all full professors talk to each other, or all people in CNN who are faculty talk to each other. Um, and the claim is that with networked individualism, we're downplaying the original uh, ascribed things, such as caste, and doing more. For one thing, we don't see each other's caste. I mean, I don't think any, maybe some Indian people put their caste status on their signature, do they? Is that here? No. You're not from India, I know. Uh, is that? You can mostly could, make up, sometimes you can make up through surnames. Through so surnames, yeah. give away But it, it's much less salient than if you saw somebody, right? And, it, and, it, and, and or if you live in the same village where it's being thrust in your face all the time. So as soon as you go electronic, there's in some ways more information available, but less information. We can't see each other, except on Skype maybe. We can't smell each other, we don't touch each other, we don't see the costumes that we're wearing. I mean, the sociology of clothes is, is fascinating, right? So, a lot of this, I'm gonna skip all of these, uh, my, my class went through now, but Technology has helped a lot. I'll just say this brief. Uh, unlike Singapore, almost every adult in North America, except for very poor, has their own car. And that means that because America, with the exception of New York, Boston, Toronto, has very bad transit systems, uh, people c used to be dependent on going as a family unit, or when the man went off to work during the daytime, the women and the children were stuck at home. Now everybody has a car, or usually a little SUV, like a van, which I don't see very many here. Uh, and so there's more individual mobility going on. Bev and I have a question, by the way. We never see convertibles here. People were top down. How come? Is it forbidden? It rains. It rains? Well, it rains. Well, it rains. Well, well, most of the time, the weather's gorgeous. Yeah. I have the Sorry, it's minus 10 and snowing in Toronto now. Don't yeah. tell me it's bad weather. <laughs> <laughs> also, international travel. Many people here have, not, have come from other countries. And people, I asked my class, I think every single person had gotten on an airplane uh, in the past year. So people are traveling a lot and learning to see each other. And also, they're less, as Denise, you would know, is, is the Czech Republic part of the Schengen Agreement yet? Yes. So you can travel most of the way through Europe without visas. And I'm amazed at how little visa information I needed to come into Singapore, also. So, in fact, Bev and I filled out a card when we came back on the airplane the other day, and they ripped it up and said, You don't need this stuff. You know, you've got to work past, welcome home. You know. So, people can move out as individuals. Airplane prices have become much lower. Uh, we don't like them. And believe it or not, even around here, there are very few crashes. Uh, you know, we know about Malaysia Airlines and Air Asia, and even, I would even fly them if I had to. But because most of the time the plane doesn't crash, and they promise to give me a refund if it does crash. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot more individual mobility, there's a lot more connectivity, and something we talked about in the class, different ethnic groups in America and in Canada marrying each other. And um, we, we, they're very, we, in fact, they stopped polling about, uh, it used to be illegal for black and white to get married in the US. Um, I'll skip. Okay, yeah, here it is. But that's become so widely accepted they don't even ask that in the in the major poll in the U.S. stuff. And clearly, to my mind, clearly, uh, gay marriage will be the next barrier that falls in the U.S. And it fell uh, ten years ago, at least in Canada, and nobody even noticed. Oh yeah, in fact, we were happy because people came to Toronto, who gay people from the U.S. to get married. It was great. Um, so it, it helped our economy and increased some of them even stayed. Our best friends are a gay couple. Um, and this was Bill Clinton's daughter, if you remember her. And she married a Jewish guy. You can tell by the little thing on top of his head. And I noticed it, but I, very few people did. I never sort of mentioned it in the newspaper. So those are ascribed barriers. Whereas when I went to college and I'm Jewish, I was told you can't go into that fraternity. You can't be a member of that group because we don't want people like you. 
So that if, that would be illegal now, and it would be so unnor so so not normative uh, that it, it would be really cut apart. Now we all know phones have gone up. I'm gonna probably skip a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, it's 3.30. Well, you can ask me questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to stop now. I have 30 more slides, but I was told to stop. The if, if you want to continue and tell Five us more, it's okay. fine. It's pretty good. We, so, you know, because it's your seminar after, so even if you go... No, it's their seminar. I'm making presentations today. Okay. So um, the data shows clearly, and I've done the studies, five other people, anybody who's done systematic work, I don't care if it's quantitative or qualitative, more than just following your own daughter around Harvard, MIT and Harvard, shows that people are well connected, they don't feel isolated. I asked the, well, I work with a Canadian survey company, and I have the slides somewhere down there, but I'm getting a little bit lost uh, in these. And we said, on balance, do you think technology has helped your family stay together or hurt it? Now, the people who are afraid of technology say, oh, no, it's awful. They, all they do is, is look at their computer. They don't talk to me. That's the standard of fear of technology line. But we will get this in our class in a couple of weeks in a little bit more detail. In practice, by five to one, quantitative five, one, uh, Ratio, those who have an answer said, no, we think technology is great for keeping our family together. The data is, is so overwhelming, they couldn't be lying. I mean, and why do they say that? Well, that's when you got to do qualitative stuff. And one thing is, I don't know about Singapore, is I would love to have, you know, talking about studies students can do, um, what's the average age in which students get their own phone? children get their own phones here? Anybody know? I don't know. It's not a trick question. Nine, ten. Nine, ten, okay. Is it a smartphone? Well, let's... Uh, I would say, yeah. Yeah, I think almost, unless you're poor, almost all phones go here, smartphones. Um, in, in Canada, when we did the survey, but we did it in 2011, it was 13. Now, it's probably gone now. And I have a picture in my book of two twin boys at 18 months playing with a laptop and, and with an iPhone. Now, it's cheating. Their parents were, uh, if you know who Gina Neff and Phil Howard are, they're good communication scholars, they, they disconnected the stuff. They said, here's your toy. And, 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 and anywhere you go, you see screens that are pacifiers for children, right? They shut up and play with the angry birds or something like that. The point is that kids like that and they, and teenagers, or even nine-year-olds, say, well, I'm liberated. I can talk to my friends. But they don't realize the trap that their parents have. And the trap is, oh, but now we can find out where you are all the time. And we can call you and say, come home. <laughs> is anybody Japanese here? I don't think so. There's a Japanese app where uh, people, mostly kids or, or salary men who are out drinking, can put on phony background noises in the background. <laughs> you surprised, Mary? <laughs> so that they can find out uh, who's doing stuff. Um, you know, they can fake that, oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at nature or something rather than the bar scene. <laughs> <laughs> but then you need the other app that locates where they are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So Google sells something called Google Latitudes. And there, I think there are many other la apps that actually say right where you are. Uh, these can be used for parental control. Um, I worked a little bit with U.S. emergency civil defense people, you know, people coming in with tsunamis or things like that, and they like that app because they want to know where their workers are. And the landlines go down, but cell phones, until they get overwhelmed, will stay up uh, longer. So there's a whole f building of technology into family toge togetherness. The other thing, and I think it may be even more true, is another question for you. In small Singapore apartments, uh, parents are often observing what their children are doing. 
the children lock the door and say, you can't come in? Well, it's pretty hard in Singapore because the apartments, many of them, are so small. So it's what we call showing and sharing. And I wrote a paper with, it's in chapter six of the book, and I also wrote a paper with Tracy Kennedy, uh, who got the PhD with me, and this was her dissertation kind of thing. Hey, look at this. Or, oh, you're looking at that. That's kind of interesting. Let's talk about that. So the internet may be isolating people, and mobile may be in some ways, but it's also connecting them and bringing them together. When I get interviewed by newspaper reporters, uh, very often say, is it a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, do you train journalism people like that? That question, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? I hate that question. And the answer is it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It depends how people shape technology. Technology gives us what we call social affordances. It gives us possibilities and constraints. But it doesn't determine anything. We need to use. Um, I just realized that camera is probably focused there. Yeah, we, we did move it. What? We moved it. We did move um, it. I'm, I'm sorry, no, no, I have no, to. Okay. It's a lot better for you. So, as I said, we have pretty big networks. Um, people don't have one surefire family community. Uh, they're going off so much on their time. Uh, so they have, to, they have to calculate, where am I going to get help from? So it's a lot of cognitive load to think about that. talked about this. Oh, I want to talk about work. The other thing that's happened, and it, has it happened in Singapore, is the size of families has gotten smaller. I was in Cambodia, and people were talking about 9, 10 children most of the time there. Uh, we, in fact, one woman wanted to give me a child. Um, I don't think it was financially. She was upset that I didn't have any. And, you know, and children have social insurance in many places. You know, who supports you when you get old? Um, but in North America, look what's happened. Percentage of marriages has gone down. The percentage of married people with children, actually having children, has gone down. Single parents have gone up. People not having any children have gone up. This means that people are more mobile because they don't have families that they have to stay home and take care of. I mean, almost only the very rich have helpers, like many middle class people have in Singapore. Some people in Toronto, actually a fair amount, have grandparents living with them to take care of their kids. Guess where these, these people in Toronto have grandparents come from? They immigrated from a certain country. Eastern Europe? No, nope. China. 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 We have 500,000 people of Chinese background in Toronto, first and second generations almost entirely. And like my student who just got her PhD, the way she got her PhD, she brought her father over. And he said, okay, thanks, Dad, you're taking care of the kid. Um, and he's, he's now a permanent resident of Canada. So it, you know, he's lost all his ties back in China, but he's, he has a prosperous life in, in, in Toronto, uh, facing all. And if you, anybody visited Toronto ever? Yeah. Well, half the city doesn't speak English as a first language, so everybody hears languages better than that. So last thing I want to, OK, there are the two boys. I love this picture. And I just want to go, and here's the one about the, uh, the work. The, I'm, I'm, I'm compressing my talk a little bit. If you want to get an improper order, come to NTU tomorrow. Uh, this is the one, you see the 5 to 1 ratio. And equally as interesting is the bottom half of that slide, which is, says that 58% of the people, they don't want to think about technology. It's just there. How many people think about a telephone or the refrigerator or stuff like that? And the internet is becoming so routinized, the mobile phones, that, that it's not that salient in people's lives. OK, let me do the network work stuff um, and, and finish off here, because that's where our research has been. Uh, Richard Florida is a very interesting guy. And I don't know if anybody read his work here. Do you do that? Um, who's talked in North America. He's, I don't think he's traveled much outside. He says something called the creative class. And he exaggerates that term. But people who work with their fingers on a computer or, or a drawing pen or, or some sort of digitally based stuff has become much larger. And people who sell things, who make things, who grow things, uh, has become smaller in North America. And he provides a lot of data about that. I don't want to 
the interpretation is in the book and go we'll through that. Okay. But what we if you if you do this, what you find is that sorry. Um, that people could be more mobile. Then if um, Evelyn and I wanted to work together, she could be in San Francisco or Singapore, I could be in Toronto, and we could send our files back and forth. In fact, last night I was on Skype with um, Toronto, and, I w and um, also I got an attachment from Toronto, so I got a lot of stuff. And even Cambodia, I had a call in Cambodia yesterday, and the notion to me of getting on the telephone and dialing I mean, Cambodia is so isolated that it's a three-digit country code, not even a two-digit country code, um, that this to me was, was, was amazing technology. And it was like I could have talked to this guy for an hour and a half. Um, so people, in theory, can work together over distances. In fact, this is our $2 million grant proposal we're putting in. And if we can find a Singapore partner, we might include them. Um, but do they? And how and what problems do they have? There's a lot of talk, if you talk to people in business school anywhere, about how people can be network work, working in multiple teams, that they can be distributed work, not working in the same place. But nobody knows in prep. We haven't been able to find one study how it worked. Excuse me. So this is what we want to find out. We're talking to some corporations like Ericsson Telecom and people make Mozilla, which is based in Toronto, uh, and to see if we can get a sizable grant to study this kind of thing. And as a prep for that, I, with three people, uh, two of which got PhDs from this project, and the third one already had a PhD, was our project manager, studied a Canadian network of researchers, mostly computer scientists and social scientists, spread across Canada. Canada is a huge country. It goes from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. I think I got my, it was, I think it's 8,000 kilometers. I didn't really check that today. Um, somebody can check it for me. The distance between Halifax and, and Victoria, if you really want to be precise. And there were 200 scholars scattered across there. And we wanted to know, does distance matter? I gave you the answer. Yes, distance matters. People still collaborate with those they can see and smell rather than 3,000 miles away. The only time when they can collaborate at a distance is when they've started working close together and then they move apart. Or if they're rich computer scientists who travel to conferences a lot, when they see each other at a conference and then they know each other, then they'll work at a distance as long as they see each other at least once a year. Second, we found that discipline matters, whether in computer science or communication. Just like Diddy's asked me, ascribe versus achieve. Every, every discipline has its knowledge, which is good knowledge, and, and which people take for granted. In my graduate course here, I kind of assumed everybody knew who Emil Durkheim was, probably the most soci famous sociologist who ever lived. And only two students out of 15 did. So I had a Actually, I skipped that, didn't I? I didn't probably explain who Durkheim was. But there's always little tacit knowledges that are important. And so discipline and subdiscipline are, are very, very important. Uh, one thing we found is gender doesn't matter, uh, at least among these scholars, that men and women equal opportunity. Once There were many more guys in the projects. So the question still is, uh, who gets in? especially in science projects. But once they're in, they, they, can, they interact as far as we can tell equally. And we found funding matters, because funding takes people to go to conferences and also buys allegiance. Just like, that's what Karl Marx said. You, know, you, you hire people that are your wage slaves, and they love you, and they think you're great, until your grant runs out. So that's a project we're just finishing up now. Uh, we have a special issue of the American Behavioral Scientist coming out about this, and that uh, it should be out in a couple of months, and the papers are just about now going on my website. The other thing I want to tell you about, and it's probably a good way to finish, is um, that 
there are two issues of the American Behavioral Sciences that we're just completing now that it will come out that it's about social networks in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, Vincent Chua, who's a brilliant young sociologist, not so young, 38 year old, at, over here in sociology in A, is it A3? <laughs> A something. Um, and who was my student in Toronto and is now doing great here. Uh, and I just finished editing it. We thought we'd get one issue, but we had so many good papers, we were able to do two issues. And, and, and that's done. Uh, we just have to write the introduction, and it should be out in about six months uh, to a year. We did East and Southeast Asia, so there's scope for somebody to do India, and, 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 and suddenly nobody's done social networks there in a systematic way in a long time that I know of. Some reader, you can tell me when I'm wrong, okay? You may be real fine. But I haven't been able to see it. But with, I, I, in, in, certainly from my course, I don't know the answer now. I will. I still have to go. We, we talked in my, I gave a lecture on writing yesterday uh, about, I have to do the summary and discussion. Remember discussion and, and think. So I have to look at all the papers and say, summarize what they found out. And I haven't done that yet. So I'll tell my class the hot findings in, in a couple of weeks right now. OK, uh, that's about as far as I can go. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read for 10 minutes and then talk again. Applause, right? <laughs> and questions? I was thinking, um, does your work find, I think the answer is yes, but is, is relating actually more work because of technology? Because I find like now, there, you know, I don't know, I'm like a zillion miles away from home and everybody wants to know how's Singapore? Yeah. And it's a lot of work. Well, we have a, we have a, we, we created an essay, a which I carefully didn't show to people in Singapore. It's saying, this is our impressions of Singapore. You know, it's a lot of domestic stuff. Like, we have only two burners in our kitchen. And I, I did a huge journal of about five pages, <laughs> and I created What shopping is like, and so, well, so we just send that out to all our friends when they say Otherwise, us. it's just too time consuming. But the thing that I know, okay, but let's go through this one. What I call the Singapore Relay, or the Singapore Relay Race, which is, I'm 13 hours ahead of my friends in Toronto. So I, they send me, I go to bed, and I wake up in the morning, <laughs> and there's this huge list, and then I spend some time adding to it, and they're sleeping, right? And I send it to Neff. It's actually a very efficient system uh, for working together. It's like instant work. Now, yesterday, last night at 9.30, was it, I spoke to my collaborator and good friend Anatoly Grush in Toronto, and I said, put on the videos on Skype. He said, no, I'm in bed. <laughs> okay, well, so, and you know, sometimes I've been in a fancy shirt but pajama bottoms for my <laughs> the other way, and as long as you don't get up, that's fine. Uh, so I find two, two things. One, for everybody who are in the creative class, work is elongated because you take it home with you. You physically carry your laptop, which I, I don't do. I'm, you know, I, carry, I have two desktops, one at home, one at work. In fact, the bigger one is at work as at home, 27 inch screen, and that's great. Um, and that's one thing that many people like us experience, and you have to learn how to shut off. And the other one is that you can now work with people in different time zones more easily. In theory, we'll see how that works. I know one business that got killed in America, uh, when doctors see a patient, they take notes and they write it down, and they used to have typists in America who would type up those notes every day. Now that all gets shipped, like I've heard about India. It gets sent to India, and people in India type it overnight and it comes back to them the next day, because that day-night shift works actually much more efficiently. But that's changing with electronic records. Maybe, we'll see if they actually, doctors actually don't bother with electronics. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you? So, um, I haven't read your book yet, right? Um, but uh, the question I wanted to ask is a little bit more broad ranging, right? So since the Blacksburg Electronic Village project, mm -hmm. there, there's some findings, right, that, that's been produced by that project in the 90s. 
they, in Blacksburg, Virginia, they gave a, a, an entire town internet and then they did uh, sociologists, psychologists did some studies and then uh, they came up with a couple of controversial findings, one of which was the internet makes us more lonely and later they came back and said no, the, actually the internet doesn't make us more lonely. But looking at where you're at now and with this book uh, and looking back at Blacksburg, what's changed since then, what's surprising, what has panned out, what hasn't panned out? Okay, good point, too. I think you're thinking of the Pittsburgh study by Robert Kraut yes. and Sarah Kiesler and people. And they found, just like you said, although they overinterpreted the data, we're talking in my class about over taking little statistical differences and making too much out of them. They found that 15, they gave everybody a, lot, a computer, because nobody had them in, well, a few people had them in 1996, and these were desktops. And they found that uh, there was some increase of expressed alienation and loneliness, just like you said. They overinterpreted it because it was only 15. It went from 5% saying they were lonely and isolated before they got computer to 15%. So they said, well, three times as many people are lonely as isolated. That's true, 5 to 15. I can do the math. What they didn't do was the subtraction. 85% said they weren't lonely and isolated even after they got the computer. So it's one of these things you can, but that story unfortunately made the front page of the New York Times, and it's never gone away. Now these people are good researchers. Their friend Robert Kraut and and Sarah Kiesler at Car Carnegie Mellon University, are, are, and to their credit, they went back and looked at those people. Uh, in a few years later, I think it was 2000. The second article was published in 2002, and they said we were wrong. What we really found was the shock of the new. People got this new technology. Anybody besides me use DOS at one point? How many DOS users here? It shows our age. <laughs> um, well, the shock of using DOS and getting on to old systems before browsers work really overwhelmed people. And that's where the uh, and but by the time people got experience with it, that wasn't an issue anymore. The expressed alienation went down. They found that their interesting finding in the second one was extroverts were much more loving of the computer than introverts. So that may be a, non, a surprising finding. But that was then. This is 15 years later. Now, almost everywhere in North America, it's hitting 89%. People are on the computer. I don't, what's the Singapore data? Anybody know? Come on, this is a CNN department. <laughs> <laughs> I think the second to South Korea. Yeah, okay. I mean, Singapore, South Korea uh, are comfortable with the computer. It's a different world. This is not, my God, I have a computer. Come see my computer. People just use it naturally. Now, it turns out that the media over exaggerates the thrill of the new. Does anybody know what the most commonly used app in America is for communication right now? Today, the study was done a few months ago. WhatsApp? What? WhatsApp? No, it's email. Remember email? <laughs> plain boring email? <laughs> That's what I communicate with my class because I'm plain boring. Um, and, and the Pew Internet, my co-author Lee Rainey just did a whole study with my former student Keith Hampton, and that's what they found. That, but the media doesn't want to, they want to talk about Twitter. Because Twitter is imageable, and they can also get on and look at it. But only, I think, less than 18% of Americans use Twitter. It's a, it's a minority. I forget the exact number. Uh, but so all the little hype stuff, you know, how much stuff about Google Glass did we see in the past couple of years? They just pulled it from the market uh, about a week ago, if I remember, because there was some major privacy issues, and they weren't worrying about whether they could actually sell it and stuff. It'll come back one way or another. Um, so the media doesn't like boring stuff, but we as social scientists should, should be able to document it. I'm curious, um, how do you view uh, the relation of, of the type of research you do to policy? What should be the, you know, what should be the, um, some recommendations based on your, on your findings to policy? Because it sounds pretty much, you know, nothing is actually happening. It's all okay, and that social and technical, n none of them is the stronger part. So in some sense, I like that your theory is not alarmist, 
-hmm. you know, and I, I mean, I come from, I'm not so familiar with the social network theories, I'm more on the philosophy side, so I'm more familiar with actor network theory, so this is probably more on that side of always exaggerating some niches and some strange occurrences, so maybe that's why I'm asking you this question, but I'm curious, like, maybe you even have some concrete examples uh, how do you think this should influence policy or how should we yeah. use these social affordances? Who should make decision on, um, on I'm the... very bad on policy, I must say. Um, to Canada is very different than, you, than, than Singapore, but to just sound as optimistic as you do, I think the first policy recommendation in Canada and in the U.S. is to connect people more. Uh, get that 12% online. Now, in the U.S., it's all poverty-based, except for Alaska, which is very strange. Um, well, that's just strange because of the, the physical isolation. Alaska is more like Canada. In Canada, the, the, the problem is a northern problem. Um, unlike, say, Finland, where Bev and I drove to the Arctic Circle in Finland, and there were bus routes and electricity. Um, and if you like civilization, continuously the whole way. Now in Canada, in many parts in the north, not hardly anybody lives there. Canada in many ways is like Chile. It's a long ribbon of population along the U.S. border. But anyway, up north, there's still many pockets of people who don't have any good internet access. So I, we, I did one study in far northern Ontario where they loved the fact that they had internet. And they loved it for some reasons. Some were good, some were bad. Uh, one reason is they could buy goods and shop more easily there. I'm not giving you a Singapore policy. I, would, I wouldn't know where to begin. Um, but they could shop more easily and use Amazon, or, or they were buying hunting goods, rifles and knives and stuff to go hunting uh, deer and things with. Uh, and they can get it shipped to their town without having to drive six hours away. They also were very concerned about medicine. In the old days, the old days were five years ago, they would have to drive six hours to get to, to a doctor. There were some few doctors coming in once in a while. Interestingly enough, and this is a funny Singapore parallel, uh, they were Israeli doctors. Israel overproduces doctors, and they can't get jobs. So they come to snowy, icy northern Canada for short-term visits. I have a hunch Singapore may overproduce doctors, too. Singapore and Israel in some ways, but remind me of each other. Maybe I'm stupid on that. There is even historical connection. Yeah, I know the training of the militia. I knew about that part. Yeah. Although in, in Israel, the women get, get to carry the guns. Okay. Um, so the other thing that happened in the far north is, and you can think about this, and maybe this is some parallels with Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, the children go off to university they don't come back. And that happened even before the internet. But now at least the parents can see themselves, can see their kids, the kids want them to see, you know, once a week or once a day. We have been doing a lot of Skype. I, I, I know many immigrant kids in Toronto who are Skyping with their parents back in their old country, Chinese student of mine, for example, daily. Um, one guy we interviewed had a little baby grandchild about a thousand miles away, and there's a webcam over the baby's crib. And he was watching his kid all day because he had nothing else to do, uh, especially in the wintertime. And these are positive things, so increased connectivity. Uh, the net, the, but you say nothing's happening. But the whole point of my book, and I, I kind of pushed over it, is we're going from a group-centered to a network-centered society. So nothing is happening, but everything is happening. And is that good or is it bad? It's both. I mean, there's a less group solidarity, less social control, for better or worse. People jaywalk in Toronto. Uh, and here's a bunch of questions I put up. I was just thinking about that today. This came in the past few hours about what, a, you know, if I had to design a research agenda for things I'm interested in, uh, what's happening to families here? People tell me family is more important. But is it less important than a generation ago? In practice, we need overtime data. I don't believe it when people say, oh, yeah, it's <coughs> important. Because people always exaggerate. It's, 
question I would want. What happens to small flats? In Hong Kong, we know everybody's eating out with their friends all the time. Is that true here? Is that what hawkers doll culture is for the consumers? Do people eat with their friends or just with their families? What's the answer? I see with their families. Those might be. So there's maybe a, a less of a friendship. Certainly, the incredible in very long hours that Singaporeans work. And then we have the interesting uh, contradiction of both diversity and homogeneity. I mean, this is an ethnically diverse society at a large scale level, but when I walk through uh, the arts canteen, I see people only of the same ethnic group eating with each other. I'm exaggerating, of course. Malays eating with Malays, etc. I'm just visually looking. I'm not going around asking, not that intrusive. Um, so, will this reduce diversity or, or not? And what happens if your parents don't want you dating somebody from a different ethnic group? Can you hide that? Because you're talking on a cell phone and they won't see you. Um, the, the work situation is another thing. When, on the one hand, people probably don't work dispersed within Singapore, because it's a central office situation, but Singapore is an international hub. A student in my class is, already has a job next year at Unilever. Um, how is she going to connect with the rest of Unilever, not all of Unilever, but with people in other countries? I mean, and that's something really worth looking into in Singapore, and will it develop more so? So these are some thoughts I had. Uh, I'm not claiming any group. They're just ideas. They're questions. They're big question marks after each one of these. But it's certainly worth uh, talking about. Now, what are the negatives of the internet and stuff? Lack of fitness, maybe? Um, so I, I met one guy. He's the dean of um, what school? Public health. Has a standing desk, desk here. And he stands up there and works all the time. My friend Howard Reingold's gone one step further. He has a standing de desk that's connected to a treadmill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, so, and the question, and, oh, and in Northern Ontario, the place I studied that, I said, what they're worried about is, yes, they're connected to their dispersed friends and relatives more, but maybe they're staying home more and not talking to their neighbors. But if Singaporeans don't talk to their neighbors anyway, what's the cost? Um, there's also the question that nobody dares say out loud in Singapore about social movements and political opposition. Will this lead to that? We know that the exaggeration of the Arab Spring uh, at least in America, people said, oh, the Arab Spring, that was caused by the internet and mobile phones. But then a number of people did studies and found that it really, it, it helped a little bit in connecting people, but not tremendously much. Uh, it was in a Western, oh, what, the, what, you know, American media is always looking for media hype. <laughs> but what about here? I mean, what about Hong Kong? I don't know the answer for the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. Uh, somebody in my class wants to look at that a little bit. Should I see your name up, up? Pauline? Uh, so that, that's something. Uh, and there may be other studies that have been done. I think Jack Xu in, in uh, City Un Chinese, Chinese University of Hong Kong has been thinking about doing that study. I'll see him in a week at a conference. Any other question? Well, about half my class is here already. So, so thank you for coming. Yeah, we're a little late.